Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be highlighting camps for kids who are coping with serious illness or disability with special guests. John LeBlanc, Chief Executive Officer of True Friends in Minnesota, Michael Katz, Executive Director of Camp Sunshine in Maine, Hillary Ackmeyer, Chief Programs Officer of the Hole in the Wall Gang in Connecticut. So thank you all for joining us. This is just wonderful. We're gonna we're gonna talk about campfires, games, cabins, silly songs. So camp is just great. Camp is just a joy, and everybody deserves to go to camp. And the fact is, is that uh, kids who have serious illnesses uh, might be immunosuppressed, might have particular special needs based on physical disability or other types of challenges. <laughs> We need to shape camps for those for those uh, youngsters and increasingly for adolescents and adults as we become much more sensitized to the needs of, of, of people who live with these illnesses, live with these conditions as they get older. So, so John, let's start with you at True Friends. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the True Friends experience and what you do that is special? We're going to go around around the um, the, the the virtual table. And, and talk about that, but then we're going to delve very deeply in a number of issues. But but uh, John, uh, tell us about True Friends. Thanks, Mark, and hello, everyone. Uh, True Friends is an organization uh, that runs uh, four locations in Minnesota, and you're all welcome to join us and, and see our locations should you uh, be in Minnesota. But uh, we run four locations dating back to 1925, and uh, they're located throughout the state. Uh, we find most of our success uh, and popularity are uh, the, the locations that are closest to the metropolitan area of the Twin Cities. Uh, we offer uh, all types of programming and activities. Uh, Mark, you talked about campfires and s'mores and swimming and fishing and all those traditional activities. Uh, we do our best to be as accessible to all, uh, regardless of, of limits, and we have a team of people that really refuse to see limits. And so uh, uh, in, in addition to that, not camp is not for everyone. Uh, so we also have adventure trips and travel trips as well. And so and we're looking forward to starting that uh, as we grow out of the pandemic. And we're gonna talk about how, how your staffs actually shape the experience with reference to expert knowledge and how to actually create this sort of seamless experience with as little seeming effort as possible, but there's a lot of effort behind the scenes. But uh, let's just uh, quickly continue with uh, with Michael, Camp Sunshine. Tell us a little bit about uh, the main experience of Camp Sunshine. Sure, well, Mark, appreciate the opportunity to, to get in front of your viewers here today and uh, delighted to be with uh, Hillary and John and, and representing their two amazing organizations. So thank you for that, first off. Um, at Camp Sunshine, our, our mission is to provide retreats that combine uh, respite, recreation, and support uh, for children with life-threatening illnesses and their whole families. So the, the whole family comes to camp. Uh, we try to make our camp sessions, at least in a traditional year, the, the pandemic has thrown some curves at us, but in a traditional year, illness-specific sessions. So we serve uh, children that have had brain tumors, cancer, sickle cell, lupus, renal disease, children that have undergone solid organ transplants. Uh, we even serve some, some rare orphan il illnesses such as Fincomian anemia, diamond black fan anemia, uh, dyskeratosis congenita, telomore uh, biology disorders. Uh, so we try to give these families a resource where they can come uh, and just be a family for a week. Uh, we're located in Casco, Maine. So we have the beautiful woods of Maine on, on Sebago Lake. So it's it's not only the, the camp program itself, but just a serene setting that, that help families heal and, and, and build a rapport in a community. And Hillary, um, Paul Newman founded Hole in the Wall Gang back in the late 80s. My mom did uh, their first uh, chief executive and some of their first, um, the searches for some of their first uh, executives. Talk about uh, this, this organization that was founded out of the, the idea and commitment of an actor and his wife and, and how the organization has uh, developed over the years to be one of the leaders in this type of program. 
Absolutely. Great. Thank you again, Mark, for this opportunity. And um, to, it's just a pleasure to be here uh, with, with you both as well. Um, Michael, a lot of our campers also go up to, to Camp Sunshine and speak so highly of your program. So it, it's nice to be able to be in the, the same space with you right now. Um, so yes, uh, Mark, Paul Newman, wonderful, wonderful man. He founded camp in 1988 and he firmly, strongly believed that he was a very lucky man and also recognized that there was a lot of people that did not share that luck. Um, and he identified children with serious illnesses as a group of kids who deserved, as he famously said, to raise a little hell and to be able to just be kids. Um, and his idea really created a, a real movement. Um, since then, a number of camps have been founded um, with very similar missions to be able to serve children with serious illnesses throughout the United States and also overseas. Um, so um, like Michael, we serve children with serious illnesses, um, everything from um, oncology, hematology, uh, metabolic conditions, some rare orphan diseases as well, um, and uh, hematology conditions. Um, and we have our, our program here. I'm, I'm sitting on site right now. We expect a, a group of campers tomorrow. So we're getting ready for our third group of campers for the summer. Um, and then we also have year round programs where we go into the hospitals um, throughout the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic. And um, we bring that spirit of camp and healing bedside, as well as a community program where we um, bring camp uh, to, uh, to, to their home or to a, a local regional center. Let's talk a little bit about the actual experience of, of camp for the family, because in this particular case, um, you're, you're dealing with all the things that anyone would deal with, but you're also dealing with anxieties, questions. You have um, uh, this whole issue of bringing people together whose the major component that they have in common is a negative, right? And so you have to overcome that aspect very, very quickly in order to get into the normality of just being a person enjoying the experience. Um, could you each comment on how you bring people into your environment in a way that deals with all these valid concerns, but also inflects from concern into joy as quickly as possible so that the experience itself is, is one of just uh, memorable positives? John, you want to you want to give it a give it a um, give it a go? I sure will. Sure will. Um, yeah, it, it's amazingly complex. Uh, uh, in addition to serving a, a variety of groups with the medical conditions that Hillary and Michael have mentioned, uh, our core programming focuses on, on people with physical and developmental disabilities, requiring a very extensive uh, application um, that includes uh, a lot of healthcare information, in some cases, behavioral information. And so that relationship really begins uh, with the camper and the parents, uh, well in advance with clear materials, uh, spelling out what, what can be expected. Uh, and then we have a customer relations team that begins working with that, that parent or caregiver almost immediately. Uh, uh, in addition to that, we have about an 80% uh, return ratio uh, percentage. So uh, we then benefit from the year over year um, uh, deepening that relationship. And then you also have have staffs that need to have these incredible array of competencies, right, Michael? Yeah, and, and that's, Mark, that actually gets pretty tricky with our, our community. Um, we have a, a skeleton crew of, of year-round staff, and and the way we execute the program is really through the help of volunteers. We bring in about, in, in a typical year, 90 to 100 volunteers per camp session, um, and usually run between 23 and 27 sessions a year uh, going through or utilizing between 2,000 and 2,500 volunteers. So some of these volunteers come with expertise and we certainly try to plug them into those roles. Uh, but oftentimes the volunteers that we have here come in, we have our, our day of training. Uh, many of them are in the nursing field or child life or social work, or by the time they leave camp, that's the direction that they, they wanna go. Um, so we do try to tap into that, but it gets very tricky. 
um, as far as making sure that people are placed in the in the correct roles and utilizing their best skills. So no one no one is is involved in this type of work for money, right? But everybody needs to get paid because they need to feed themselves. They need to pay rent and so on. How do you deal with that, Hillary? This this whole idea of you have to have the right person with the right heart and the right commitment. You also have to figure out how to bring the resources to bear. Um, how 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 do you approach that whole uh, issue with the hole in the wall game? Yeah, well, it's it's a great point, and one thing that I want to add um, is that all of our services are completely free. So any family, any child, and I think this is the same for all of my colleagues here on the, on the the show as well. Um, So our families and our caregivers, they don't, they don't pay to come to camp. And we want to make that very clear that everyone can participate regardless of um, how much money they may or may not have. Um, And so we, uh, we have to raise a lot of money. Um, And so we're really fortunate that we have a, um, a wonderful team of fundraisers, uh, a, a large development staff that is able to to, to raise the money. Um, every and, dollar goes to a child, right? Every, it, it, yep. it, in, in a direct or an indirect way, it either ends up on their plate in terms of, of what they eat um, yep. or the treatment that they receive or the experience that they have every single dollar, right? Every, 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 every single dollar, every single cent. And it's not as, again, as my colleagues would know here as well, it's, um, it is, it's, it's not, it is, it's expenses to be able to have our campers on site with all the medical care that, that is needed. Um, we're very fortunate again, similarly, that we do have a lot of volunteers, um, and, um, who are, who are excited and committed to do this work. And I think that, you know, goes to your question, Mark, is we have an incredibly dedicated community of donors as well as volunteers who really believe in this work um, and um, and 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 contribute it really it really takes a village to pull this off and we're so fortunate to have um, both that in our in our donors as well as in our volunteers and staff um, a lot of our, and we're really proud of this, we have a number of our, our seasonal staff um, that come in year after year to work with our, our kids in the summer are also former campers. And so they really have, um, they've experienced firsthand the impact of camp and how it impacted their lives um, and, um, and they are paying it forward. And so we, we have over a 35%, actually it's even higher this year, of our of our staff um, and volunteers have have been campers and can really relate to our to our campers on a firsthand level. Now, in terms of of the um, of, of your uh, professional staff, you need people who keep the lights on, right? You need people who are going to sustain the organizations through the various seasons. And camps are traditionally. Uh, viewed as summer experiences, which, you know, three, four, five-month experiences, and then they close down. Um, Are you all moving toward more of a year-round kind of a situation? And also, let's also bring in COVID here, because particularly for immunosuppressed um, uh, youngsters, uh, COVID was a was a deadly danger. How did you how did you navigate that? How are you continuing to navigate that? Any uh, anyone, please jump in. Well, uh, John LeBlanc here. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, yeah, COVID certainly was was a, a killer for for many of us. Shut us down or shut shut us down. Um, I want to just I, I have to add one thing here to the last question and comment. Uh, we do have scholarship financial assistance for our participants, and we provide scholarship dollars for everyone who asks. However, our our program is fee based. Um, with all of our core programs. So I just want to uh, make sure that, that that's clear uh, for our organization. Um, uh, COVID uh, shut us down. Before COVID 2019, we had a record year in people served, finances, philanthropy, um, really in most measures. Uh, and we were really excited. Uh, 2020, uh, it felt like a flywheel. We were already in the first two months looking at another re- record breaking year by the end of 2020. Um, uh, in a given year, we would have over 20,000 individuals visit our four locations. Um, so that's the kind of volume of people we're talking. Um, and now we're just building that back. 
So uh, uh, we are, Michael, are, are you, did you also have this, this kind of uh, step into a, to a, a big hole during COVID? We, we did. We had a, we had to get very creative and, and I've got kudos to my staff for their imagination and, and their, their ability to find ways to stay connected to our families. Our, our last in-person session was in February of 2020 because we do winter sessions as well. Um, we're in the process right now. And in fact, we're opening up next week back to in-person sessions. But really what kept us connected was our, our pretty robust virtual programming. We put together what we called boxes of sunshine that we sent out to families that had the Camp Sunshine tape on it. So when families received it, um, they couldn't help but know where it came from, one of their favorite places where they, they've developed such a community. Um, and inside there was things like arts and crafts and camp swag and our partners would put some items in there. And we also had items in there that uh, marshmallows, popcorn that tied into the, the second prong of our, our three prong virtual programming. <laughs> our Together at Home Zoom presentation where we put together 10 uh, illness specific sessions where we went into families' homes for four nights a week and did some of their favorite activities, had their favorite entertainers, the talent show, pancake breakfasts. Um, we had interactive animal presentations. We did our famous wish boat launch. Um, so families really could stay connected. And from there, we also had a special website uh, where families could go to and and click on how to, how to do their arts and crafts, and they would get videos of some of their favorite volunteers showing them how to do it. We had kids kicking karate, presenting karate programs. Uh, we had special messages from Miss Maine, from Spider-Man, Elsa, and, and a bunch of superheroes. So um, between those three items, we were able to serve over 660 families. So the silver lining being that some families that otherwise may not have been able to come to camp, we could still reach. We had families in hospital rooms participating, uh, we even had a family in England that were waking the children up at midnight because of the time difference to participate. So it was a, a lot of fun, although we can't wait to get back to in-person. Well, that's great. I mean, it really does bespeak the creativity that everybody contributes to, right? This is not; These are not top-down organizations in the sense of all the ideas originate from some executive sitting in some someplace, right? The executives basically are enabling the front frontline staff. You're holding... The, the 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 structure together so that the real heroes of your movement, the people who are actually providing the services, right, Hillary, that they can do their thing, they can contribute their ideas as as Michael just outlined during this sort of COVID time. Um, how how do you ensure that those people get the proper support, and how do you ensure that they remain energized mm -hmm. year after year? Because this is a stressful kind of a role. There's there's a certain trauma that is um, also uh, generated, particularly in people with a high level of empathy, mm -hmm. where there are they're identifying with with kids who um, who um, have very serious illnesses that have very serious restrictions, some of whom will pass away. How does that how does that work? How do you how do you keep people coming back? It's a great. It's a it's a great point, and I think it's something that we have seen um, uh, that that level of burnout or stress um, really increase over the past several years. Um, there is a lot of planning and prep and mental work, mental load that goes into what we do on a normal day, and then you add COVID on top of that, um, and it, it really does it really does create challenges. I think that what COVID took away was um, for, for our frontline staff was like, finally, they're there together. They can see the kids' faces. They can see the laughter. They can see the magic coming together. Um, and similarly, in 2020, we were not able to run any in-person programming and shifted everything virtual. Um, which was wonderful. And, you know, we, we, we were, we were excited about it, but that feeling of being in the same space in the same room, um, there's just, there's just nothing like that. And so we had to work really closely, provide services, um, mental health support to our staff, to our volunteers, really encourage that maintaining that connection as, as much as possible. Um, we were fortunate we were able to start programming in the fall of 2020 um, with, with the ability to test folks and distance and masking. So we have been running programming, albeit very modified, um, since the fall of 2020. Um, 
And um, we've just been amazed by the resilience of our staff and volunteers to roll with every pivot, every change um, along the way and, and them being, you know, really guiding the way with with a lot of these of these shifts. We keep saying we're we're making lemonade out of a lot of lemons for sure. It's interesting. We just had two polls. The third one is going on right now. It'd be very interesting to see uh, the answers to that poll. The first poll was, do you know of these camps? And 90% said that they did. So you all have done a really good job of getting the word out. There's still that 10% who still need to be informed. And then we also asked uh, how many people have uh, acquaintances who have taken advantage of this. And about 50% said, yes, of course, we have a selected audience here. This, this next poll, and I, I'm really interested to see what the answers are here. What do you think are advantages of these unique camps? And the question is, is really going to be in the time of COVID, how can we adopt? If the, if the advantages that we generally deliver, it's a point that Michael made uh, and Hillary, uh, you made it as well, that what, what is needed is that we have to figure out a way to bring as many of these advantages in a remote situation where we are kind of restricted. Where, kind of uh, bound um, from from doing that in-person thing. But John, I'd like to come to you in terms of this whole question of how do you ensure that your staff is getting the proper uh, care and and that, that community it continues, um, particularly during COVID where people can't necessarily get together. Are you finding that you're investing more time and energy in sort of bringing people together and having the debriefs and and having the discussions um, that uh, help to form a community? Are you basically taking a modern approach to community building amongst your people, given the fact that you have very uh, dispersed operations in four different camps uh, going out, going on throughout Minnesota? Um, I, I'll tell you, I, I won't lie. It's been challenging, right? Uh, I We have been... Uh, our, our summer camp programming did shut down in 2020. Our equine therapy uh, just shut down for two weeks and restarted again in 2020. Um, one thing that we're, I think we're a little unique um, from maybe uh, Camp Sunshine and Hole in the Wall Gang, I'm not sure, but uh, we actually focus, uh, most of our services are provided to the individual and not families. And so a lot of our family-based options will be through some of our partners. So uh, when we're working with individuals, uh, we were able to jump in last year uh, and serve campers, uh, albeit very small, uh, maybe, maybe 500 uh, in, in the entire year. Uh, but now we've more than doubled that for this year. And so we're building out. Um, but it's been challenging the team building and virtually only gets you so far. Uh, so our teams are starting to get together. I want to talk a little bit about accessibility of these programs. Um, if you take a look at, ca at the camping experience in general, we have a history in this country of excluding people based on religion, race, um, gender, and so on and so forth. Um, how do you deal with ensuring that that uh, people of different income levels, for example, um, of, of, of different communities, locations, races, and so on, that um, and orientations, all those different aspects, which which interact with the disability and and um, and uh, illness uh, communities. Um, how do you how do you navigate this this area of necessary change in the camping experience, uh, Michael? How, how how do you how do you um, manage these kinds of issues? Yeah, much much like hole in the wall is uh, there is no requirement to come to camp. We don't check anybody's uh, financial backing. Um, camp. The only common denominator is that there's a child that is ill. Um, so camp is open to everybody. Um, we do try to to make sure there aren't any impediments to coming to camp. So we do have uh, funders that help support transportation. So if families can't uh, afford transportation just to get to camp. We'll help out with that. Uh, once at camp, everything is provided for them. Uh, and some of our, our illnesses, we have actually provided buses and have gone into the cities and uh, had the buses available to the families. Uh, so they merely just need to sign up. But 
Um, there is no stipulation, no no rules. Uh, families come to camp. Everything is provided for them. Again, the, the only common denominator is the, the, the nil child and the family that need help, and, and we want to help them. So insofar as it's possible, you're trying to level the playing field in as many respects as you possibly can. As much as possible, correct. And Hillary, um, are, are you taking the same basic approach? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so similarly, we do provide transportation. We work with a number of local hospitals um, in uh, the Northeast and down into the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, And so we provide buses for every clinic. Um, And so kids are coming up on a bus. If for some reason an individual wants to get dropped off by their parent or caregiver, they absolutely can, um, but we'll reimburse for gas if requested. Um, Again, so no barriers um, for, for getting here What whatsoever. Um, We provide translation services when it comes to applications. Um, And we also have a a really extensive program um, for our year round staff, which is there's about 80 of us, as well as our um, seasonal staff um, around diversity, equity and inclusion training programming to really ensure that we are meeting um, the needs for for all who are coming to camp and being able to um, to really meet everyone at their level where they are when they arrive at camp and providing them whatever they may need. And John, you have an earned income and philanthropic uh, model. In terms of the scholarships that you provide, it, are, are they basically funded through your earned income streams or are they funded through uh, special uh, donations or scholarship funds? Yeah, scholarship uh, through philanthropy, private philanthropy. We raise about $1.5 million in general operating and financial assistance a year. And does most of that go to a particular cause or, or scholarships, or is it just go into the general fund and then you, you manage that uh, um, as according to the, the overall financial health of the organization? Yeah, we, we budget uh, financial assistance dollars based on previous years, mm-hmm. uh, and we raise the money before we use it or before we distribute it or allocate it. So we're ahead by a year. Uh, uh, which we not we weren't used to be, but that really helps financially. And uh, our donors are generous. And so in addition to our operating fund and financial assistance, of course, we all are, are addressing huge capital needs at our locations. You know, the, the actual art of financially managing a, a, a sustainable uh, nonprofit that is providing these types of services is, is uh, quite a story in and of itself. We did our final poll and we asked, what do you think are the advantages of these unique camps? And it's interesting. We allowed people to only answer uh, select one. And we got um, help help uh, kids forget their limitations and illness for a short time, bond with others, and uh, give young folks the confidence to try new activities with um, a, a small response on, on the family side. But this is really about sort of creating a um, an embrace and acceptance and normality uh, for for the young folks. Um, do you see that as as part of the model that we should all be following in society? That we should actually not make your camp as much as an exception as it is. And as a matter of fact, in our working environment, we should be behaving that way. In our educational environment, we should be behaving that way. In our daily lives in cities. We should actually be emulating what you're doing and trying to come together to help those of us who are our neighbors who just are living in different circumstances. How do you, how do you feel? We're going to go around one more time. We're going to start with, with John, uh, go to Michael and end with Hillary. We're going to give Hillary the last word. Uh, John, you want to comment on this? Absolutely. We, uh, uh, throughout all of society, we should be trying to make things as accessible and inclusive as possible. I think it's a both and answer, though, uh, because uh, kids with juvenile diabetes, it's extremely helpful for them to come together as a group and realize that they're not alone in this unique challenge that they're given. And so I really think it's a both and answer. Thank you. Michael, what's your take? Yeah, I think it's the need to form that community um, and that community itself then provides the resources and the, and the support. And as John said, it eliminates some of that, that isolation or, or, or feeling that they're in this alone uh, and then they know they have a community to, to back them. Um, it's a community that no one wants to be a part of, but 
once you're a part of it, it it's it's nice for our families to know that they have camp sunshine and, and that's the the sunshine to this illness is is that they have camp um, but totally agree with john that yes it's it's you wish that it was across the board but it's that support and resource that helps the families yeah. And at Hole in the Wall, you want your your youngsters to raise a bit of hell, right? <laughs> you do. And we encourage that safe, safe, safely. Um, so, yes, we we feel very, very similarly. Um, and we, we talk about this. We talk about this with our kids when they first arrive on site um, and we give them those those final words when they when they're saying goodbye to you know continue this, the spirit, the safety of the respect, the love they feel here on site, continue to bring that outside of the gates of camp and they'll make the world a better place. Truly inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing your experiences and helping us bring some of that sensibility into our daily lives. John LeBlanc, Chief Executive Officer of True Friends in Minnesota, Michael Katz, Executive Director of Camp Sunshine in Maine, and Hillary Ackmayer, Chief Program Officer of the Hole in the Wall Gang in Connecticut. Thank you so much. And to our audience, please come back uh, uh, on Thursday for this last segment for uh, the Ukrainian aid uh, group. And then in September, we'll be we'll be back again uh, with a whole new set of shows. Thank you all for helping us out uh, in terms of understanding this very unique set of services that you provide. Everybody stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you